So welcome all to New Perspectives and this first in a new six-part series, The Spiritual Essence of Religions and Their Role in the Future Development of Mankind. I'm Rade and I am joined by Dr. Vladimir Yatsenko, one of our two speakers for today, and of course my colleague here at La Grasse Urbindo Integral Life Center in Fountain Inn, uh, South Carolina. Um, H.P. Rama is also with us today. H.P. is the founder and president of our university and benefactor of the Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Centers. And of course, joining us today is also our very special guest speaker, Robin Blanche. Robin, we want to welcome you to, uh, to New Perspectives. We are thrilled and honored to have you with us here today. Uh, before formally introducing this series, um, I'd like to just make two very important announcements. Uh, first of all, our 2023 Sri Aurobindo Integral Yoga Retreat, which is July 5th through 9th, will be held here at Greenville Marriott in South Carolina. And I just want to remind everyone that our early discount rate does end on May 31st. So be sure to take advantage of this discount rate and mark on your calendars July 5th through 9th. If you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to reach out and ask me, but I'll be posting the URL shortly in the chat box. Also, this Sunday begins our five-week workshop on Ayurveda nutrition with Minakshi Gupta. Minakshi was a featured speaker at LaGrasse's Ayurveda immersion program last month. And this particular program runs from May 7th to June 4th and will be every Sunday from 1115 to 12.30 Eastern Daylight Time. So again, I'll also be posting a separate URL to find out more about this Ayurvedic nutrition, but still time to, uh, to register. So once again, our series on the spiritual essence of religions and their role in the future development of mankind begins today. India has been the cradle for major religions since time immemorial, and religion has guided civilizations in giving meaning to the purpose of life in creating social stability and psychological well-being and guiding moral behavior. In various cultures, religion has been expressed through its sages, its poets, musicians, philosophers, and literature. This new perspective series outlines some of the major aspects of religions that have eternal and intrinsic values for the future development of mankind. Sri Aurobindo says, the Integral Yoga takes up all the religions in their essence and tries to arrive at a unification of all of these aims, methods, and approaches. For Integral Yoga stands for an all-embracing philosophy and practice. So today we will start at the very beginning with the Rig Veda, addressed by Vladimir Yatsenko, followed by Avesta, addressed by Robin Blanche. So let me more formally introduce Robin. Robin was born in Switzerland and has lived in several countries. He was raised in a spiritual household and inclined towards spirituality since his early childhood. And after graduating from UCLA, he discovered Sri Aurobindo. And reading the ideal of human unity, Robin decided to pursue an MA in human behavior and urban planning from the United States International University, San Diego. And he subsequently worked in the local San Diego County government for four years. Robin completed his degree in metaphysics from the National Academy of Metaphysics in California. He studied astrology with Carol Ryder and psychology at William Lyon University in San Diego. Robin has been initiated by Swami Veda Bharati and Pandit Rajmani of the Himalayan tradition. He has been a member and officer in the, Sai, the Sri Satya Sai Baba organization. So once again, we welcome you, Robin, and it is truly an honor to be hosting you here for the first time at La Grasse and as a keynote speaker. Of course, you all know Vladimir. Vladimir is here at the uh, Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center in Fountain Inn, and he is the director of our Institute for Applied Research in Integral Studies. So without further ado, um, I would like to go ahead and turn it over to uh, you, Vladimir, and uh, your talk on the Rig Veda. Thank you, Radha. So today we start this journey and we would like to look into the religions from another perspective 
of their values for the future of mankind, that those intrinsic values, those spiritual values, which we would like to highlight, which are contributing to our future development. And I will start with PowerPoint presentation. Do you see it? Yes, most probably, yes. Um, and I will give you a highlight of what Veda means for us and for Indian civilization. I will use uh, Sri Aurobindo's interpretation. The Veda was the beginning of our spiritual knowledge. The Veda will remain its end, says Sri Aurobindo. So you can see that uh, he put so much um, meaning into the Veda. If the Veda was the beginning of our spiritual journey and will remain its end, that everything is already there, but we have to discover it. Sri speaks on the Veda in this way. At the root of all that we, the Hindus have done, thought and said through these many thousands of years, behind all we are and seek to be, there lies concealed the fount of our philosophies, the bedrock of our religions, the kernel of our thought, the explanation of our ethics and society, the summary of our civilization, a small body of speech, Veda. From this one seed, developing into many forms, the multitudinous and magnificent birth called Hinduism draws its inexhaustible existence. Buddhism too, with its offshoot, Christianity, flows from the same original source, it has left its stamp on Persia, through Persia on Judaism, through Judaism, Christianity, and Sufism on Islam, and through Buddha on Confucianism, and through Christ and medieval mysticism, Greek and German philosophy and Sanskrit learning on the thought and civilization of Europe. There is no part of the world's spirituality of the world's religion, of the world's thought, which would be what it is today if the Veda had not existed. Of no other body of speech in the world can this be said. So if you look into the main points of the Veda, what Veda is really offering to us. So I just put few of these major points which are important for our future. I start with the end, as it were. Mm -hmm. The Vedic Rishis are really not aspirants. They are not those who aspire to be something. They are not, they are rather inspirants. They are bringing inspiration to us. We may say, um, they are not evolutionary, but involutionary beings, as Mother says. They bring the higher consciousness down to us for the transformation of our nature through the process they call yajna, the sacrifice. Man is a transitional being, says Sri Aurobindo. The Veda says that man is the ever advancing pilgrim. The sacrifice was envisioned as a constant transformation of our earthly nature by the spirit and its forces called gods, who were invoked and brought down into the body. The sacrifice was making our nature sacred. It was seen as the path, the journey, the battle with opposing forces who tried to oppose us in our advancement. Abhisyama pritsutir martyanam. May we withstand the oppression of mortals, exclaims the Rishi. Human beings are evolutionary beings. 
They are the souls, the psychic beings in the language of the integral yoga. They evolve, change, and progress. The concept of evolution of consciousness is a fundamental contribution of the Veda. It is only in the Rig Veda that the Rishis speak of the descent of a higher consciousness. The gods are invited to come down into our lower hemisphere of our mind, life, and body, and through us to rise to the supreme throne from which they can behold both realms of deity and aditi, the finite and infinite consciousness. These are few highlights of why the Rig Veda is important for us and what it actually formulates for the future development of all philosophies, religions, and especially integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo, because it is only in the integral yoga we speak of the descent from above of a higher consciousness into our body. So Sri Aurobindo, on his search of the Veda, and this would be the part which I, I like most, and I would like to share this with you. Sri Aurobindo, on his search on the Veda, of the, for the bed. Mm -hmm. I seek a light, says Sri Aurobindo, that shall be in you, yet old, the oldest indeed of all lights. It reminds me of the uh, hymn to the dawn, where she is called Purani Yuvatih. She is the ancient and ever young the most ancient and ever young. So that light Sri Aurobindo seeks. And it's quite interesting because Aravinda is the one who seeks the light. His name is like this, the seeker of light, uh, seeker of the dawn, seeker of the divine mother, uh, because the dawn is the symbol of the divine mother. I seek an authority that accepting, illuminating, and reconciling all human truths shall yet reject and get rid of by explaining it all mere human error. I seek a text and a shastra that is not subject to interpolation, modification, and replacement that moth and white ant cannot destroy, that the earth cannot bury, nor time mutilate. I seek an asceticism that shall give me purity and deliverance from self and from ignorance without stultifying God and his universe. I seek a skepticism that shall question everything but shall have the patience to deny nothing that may possibly be true. I seek a rationalism, not proceeding on the untenable supposition that all the centuries of man's history except the 19th were centuries of folly and superstition, but bent on discovering truth instead of limiting, limiting inquiry by a new dogmatism, obscurantism, and furious intolerance, which, is, which it chooses to call common sense and enlightenment. I seek a materialism, materialism that shall recognize matter and use it without being its slave. I seek an occultism that shall bring out all its processes and proofs into the light of day, without mystery, without jugglery, without the old stupid call to humanity, be blind, O man, and see. In short, I seek not science, not religion, not theosophy, but the Veda the truth about Brahman, not only about his essentiality, but about his manifestation, not a lamp on the way to the forest, 
but a light and a guide to joy and action in the world. The truth, which is beyond opinion, the knowledge which all thought strives after. Yasmin Vijnate Sarvam Vijnatam. The knowledge by which everything can be known. I believe that Veda to be the foundation of Sanatana Dharma. I believe it to be the concealed divinity within Hinduism. But a veil has to be drawn aside. A curtain has to be lifted. I believe it to be knowable and discoverable. I believe the future of India and the world to depend on its discovery and on its application, not to the renunciation of life, but to life in the world and among men. Profound statement of Sri Aurobindo. This is what it means for him, the Veda. And to conclude my overview, I found one passage in his diary, which he writes for himself. The world is one in all its parts. Every being in it contains the universe in himself. Especially do the great gods contain all the others and their activities in themselves, so that Agni, Varuna, Indra, these are the godheads of the Veda. Agni is aspiration from below, Indra is answer from above, and Varuna is the purity of the divine existence. All of them are in reality one sole existent deity in many forms. Man too is he but he has to fulfill himself he as man, yet divine, through the puissant means provided for him by the Veda, Sri Aurobindo. Thank you, this is all of my presentation and uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end, so we could uh, speak more about it. Thank you. And now uh, Robin will speak on Zaratustra, Zoroaster. Yes, you have to unmute yourself, Robin. There we go. Do I go share screen now? Yes, please. There we go. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. I think we're on now. Can you see it all? Yes, uh -huh, we can see. Okay. <clears throat> Zoroaster was born, it's estimated that he was born about 1700 BC in northeastern Iran, in what is known as Bactria today. It's actually, um, today is probably part of the northwestern portion of Afghanistan. And the date of his birth is actually not known for sure. Um, Aristotle said that he estimated that Zoroaster was born about 5000 years before Plato. So there, there's a question as to when he was actually born. But for general purposes, it's assumed he was born about 1700 BC. Um, Zoroaster's mission was to establish a monotheistic religion um, with one creator, which was Ahura Mazda, rather than the polytheistic um, worship of the powers of nature, which were prevalent at the time in, in Central Asia there. Um, it believes in the absolute creator who is the essence of all that is good and a dark force that acts to um, detract mankind. 
Um, can I make this a little bit narrower here? Excuse me. We're matching the, the three. From the sixth to the third centuries BC, the Gatas, which are portion of the Zendavesta, and these are the actual songs that Zoroaster composed. They were the existential philosophy of the vast empire that stretched all the way from the Mediterranean Sea to the Himalayan mountains. And uh, as you can see here, it, it goes from the Indus River all the way up into Central Asia. Uh, Bactria is up here in the northeastern portion. And then it went um, in the west all the way to Macedonia in northern Greece, uh, through Syria and Egypt and Libya today. So it was a huge empire and it lasted a long time. Um, all told, I think it was over a thousand years that the empire lasted for. Um, it became Zoroaster's um, doctrine was accepted by the king at the time and it was made into the state religion and it was the first really state religion and under Cyrus the Great, uh, there was what was called the first charter of human rights uh, came into being. And this doctrine was engraved on some clay prisms uh, about 2,541 years ago. And an example of this is in the British Museum. <clears throat> Zoroaster's influence also spread to China, to Greece, to Eastern Europe, to Poland, Germany, Egypt, and um, also to India. And um, this Charter of Human Rights that was established by Cyrus the Great, who lived from 580 to 529 BC, uh, states that I have granted to all humans the liberty to worship their own gods and ordered that no one can ill treat them for this. I order that no house should be destroyed. I guarantee peace and tranquility for all humans. I recognize the right for everyone to live in peace in the country of their choice. So that, in those times, that was a very revolutionary idea to have come about. Uh, this is a picture of Zoroaster, all dressed in white. It uh, When he came, he meditated for 30 years on top of a mountain. And when he had, had his revelation, he came to the court of King Gustashta and uh, presented himself in the doctrine. And this is approximately, he was dressed all in white and um, the king uh, then embraced his doctrine. And that's how it became the state religion of the, the great empire. Um, the language of the Gatas is very similar to Sanskrit. It's believed that there was communication between the Iranians and the Indians in the Vedic period. Pliny the Elder, um, who was a Greek, states that Pythagoras, Plato, and others traveled to study the sciences of Zoroaster. In his treaty on philosophy, Aristotle says that the Magi were the most ancient, were more ancient than the Egyptians. Diogenes states that Zoroaster was the originator of wisdom. The three Abrahamic religions, uh, which are uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, inherited the doctrines of age and geology, demonology, and the coming of a savior, uh, the resurrection of the dead, and the final judgment. These are all ideas that Zarathustra came up with and that were part of the religion. So uh, Zoroaster, was kind of like the grandparent of all of these three religions. After the Greek invasion in 334 BC, all the great libraries in Persia were destroyed. But the Gathas uh, had been memorized by the, the Magians, the priests. And um, with the rise of the Parthian Empire, which happened after the Greek, uh, the Greek civilization had dissolved, um, when it rose, then the, the uh, gathas were recorded, they were written down, 
And that became the last part of the Zend Avesta, which is today the Zoroastrian scriptures. In 642 AD, the Arabs invaded the Parthian Empire and basically ended Zoroaster's vision for what he hoped Iran to be. And uh, that's when some of the Magians, the priests uh, of Zoroaster, uh, left Iran and went to India. Okay, this is the basic doctrine of Zoroaster. Is, um, it was a monotheistic religion. Uh, Hura Mazda was the wide, wise lord. Uh, he's considered both mother and father of the universe, the soul of nature. Um, they had the idea, he had the idea of good and evil opposing Ahura Mazda. There is an evil force named Angra Mainyu who pollutes humanity and causes illness, poverty, sorrow, unhappiness. And that's uh, one of the things that we have to uh, ward against. Uh, they also had the idea of saushans or saviors. Um, in both the original Indo-European and Zoroastrian religions is the belief of saviors, who are human heroes, uh, who have been and will be born in the world to guide the humanity towards a final perfection. Uh, Zarathustra was one of these saviors. Uh, final judgment and resurrection. After death, the soul is judged. If it is judged to be good, it easily passes to the other side. If it is judged to be bad, the bridge, which was called Chinvat, becomes narrow and the soul falls into a hellish realm to be purified. Because all souls were created as good beings, it is the will of the wise Lord that in the end all souls should be saved and made perfect and immortal. The Zoroastrians were the inventors of magic. The, the word magic and magi are the same. The magi were the priests of Zoroastrianism. And <clears throat> unlike sorcery, magic is the practice of enjoining the angels, archangels, and the guardian angels, the Amashpentas, the Yazatas, and the Fravashis, to create harmony between the spiritual and the physical world. Uh, rituals and initiation, these are a very important part of Zoroastrianism. And the aim of the rituals is the individual enlightenment and perfection of the individual. Astrology and numerology were used in ceremonies, uh, each degree of the zodiac and each number having a particular quality that aided in the effectiveness, effectiveness of the ritual. Uh, astrology was actually it derived from Egypt and uh, Babylon, and uh, it was the Persians who actually took it and perfected it in being able to use it for nativity charts for both individuals and institutions. So they, they made it uh, applicable as we see it is today. And that's how they were, the Magi were actually able to find the, find Jesus and predict his birth and location. <clears throat> Wheels of power. This is also very interesting. I find that uh, in Persia, they understood the, the entire chakra system. And um, I should go to the next slide here. Here's the the wheels of power, um, number seven, which is the crown chakra, the color is white, and that is Ahura Mazda. So that's the same as the divine, the absolute divine resides in us. Um, and then on down the Ajna chakra, the violet color, um, and so on. The, the gatas, these are the songs that Zoroaster composed. The, these are the actual words that he sang. And uh, the way a lot of them are composed is that he would pose a question to Ahura Mazda, and then he would reflect on this until he got the answer directly from the divine. And so a lot of the gatas are these answers that he got from Ahura Mazda. And I'll read the last one here. Gata song eight, stanza one. 
Ahura Mazda has set the principle of existence in such a way that happiness is for the one who makes others happy. This is, again, an unbelievably revolutionary idea for an age that was approximately 4,000 years ago. Okay, and this is the, the last part. What are the relevant aspects of Zoroastrianism that, um, that are applicable to our times today? Number one, Zoroaster embraces practices and initiations that empower the individual with knowledge of the world and how to use the inner instrument, the self, to be an effective co-creator with Ahura Mazda to bring about perfection in the world. Two, Zoroaster viewed the absolute Godhead as pure focused consciousness. Ahura is the essence and is masculine. Mazda is the feminine, the source of wisdom, and is feminine. Three, co-creators. Human beings were made as co-creators, as colleagues, as friends, to help him in the creative process of transforming the world, a world able to provide happiness for all living beings, humans, animals, and plants. So there's a real completeness from, from the divine all the way down to the, to the very lowest physical, the inconscient, I think, as you would say, in Shara window. Number four, by understanding the ritual associated with the celestial and symbolic realm, Minoj, and the terrestrial world, Getig, a man can become perfect in the material world, even immortal physically. Five, the truth does not belong to any people, country, or race. Six, there is no original sin in Zoroastrianism. So we don't have to be redeemed, you know, by believing in one particular, either being or individual. Seven, the doctrine of human rights that uh, Cyrus the Great recorded 2,541 years ago, <clears throat> which became the doctrine of the empire, says that <clears throat> I have granted to all human beings the liberty to worship their own gods and have ordered that no one can ill-treat them for this. I ordered that no house should be destroyed. I guarantee peace and tranquility for all humans. <clears throat> I recognize the right of everyone to live in peace in the country of their choice. Eight, Persian women enjoyed unprecedented liberty throughout the empire. And nine, the goal, the end is not for us to be reabsorbed into some cosmic oneness, but to be rewarded at the end of the battle with an eternal life of knowledge. And I can't see that there. Um, pleasure in a spiritual and physical state. The truth is human beings are born to be wise, strong, and immortal. The lie is that humans are stupid, weak, and mortal. The key to the activate activation of happiness is linked to the amount of good we do for others. And 10, lastly, clean up the environment, help the helpless creatures, aid your fellow humans in their minds and bodies, and your magic, which is your spiritual realization, will reach a new dimension. So that concludes the um, little presentation on Zoroastrianism, and I have another one which is much more detailed, which we'll post if anybody's interested to know more of the background of uh, where all of this comes from, uh, that will be available. So if anybody has any questions or answers, feel free to speak up. So we have still a long way to go yes, to reach the ideals of Sarastra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you know, I'm wondering, Vladimir, if um, that was absolutely wonderful, Robin, first of all, thank you so much. I was totally unfamiliar with Zoroastra and uh, amazing for me to see some of the parallels and similarities to integral uh, yoga as you read through the various principles and the aim. Um, I'm curious, Vladimir, did uh, Sri Aurobindo uh, mention Zoroastra at, at any point in time in his writings that you're aware of? 
And if so, uh, what did he, what were his comments or ideas? Actually, not so much. We, we do, yeah, I read the passage where he says that they were the influence to the Persia and Persia influenced the rest. And we see these ideas coming from uh, Zoroaster, who were, uh, because we have Indo Iranian um, oneness. Before Indo Aryan uh, unity in India, we had the Indo Iranian preceding it. You see, there was. Um, uh, one one religion before, so it was pre Chaldean pre Vedic tradition, yes, which was common for both for Central Asia, Persia, and India. And I think uh, Zoroaster was one of those um, uh, one of those um, uh, people who tried to or prophets rather, or helpers as he calls himself, not a helper, but the, the one who is to, uh, how to say that there is a name for it, who, who tries to, like a prophet, who tries to modify the religion and make it more monotheistic. Monotheism comes later in time as a, because of the mental structure is emerging. And so there is a need to satisfy this vision of oneness of the world. Uh, whereas in uh, the Veda, they do not care about that much. They are rather dealing with, with uh, the divine forces, as Shubhendra describes this, as one, of course, or they are all one, but it's understood, it is not emphasized, it is not the part of the doctrine, because it is um, already understood. So they are dealing with these forces in their action and they see how they change and transform our life. So, and then there is a need to move away from polytheism and Zoroaster comes into picture and he makes this move to emphasize that oneness rather than diversity of the gods. And uh, so in that way, this is a very interesting transition from true polytheism, spiritual polytheism of the Veda, so-called spiritual polytheism means, which is just the word coined by the Western scholars, to more monotheistic view on life, yes, where there is one Godhead, one spirit, he is father and mother in himself, yes, and uh, everybody has the right to find his way to it, live in a country he wants, believe in whatever he wants to believe. These are high ideals of democracy, <laughs> which yeah. we are trying to follow today. I know that I deviated from the answer because truly speaking to so speak, um, uh, I don't know anything. I don't remember anything should have been just speaking specifically on Zoroaster. Uh, of course, we can mention here Nietzsche and uh, thus spoke Zaratustra, which he is he's using the, his name. And it's amazing that uh, the whole philosophical vision of Nietzsche, which Shobindo was um, of a high opinion about, he spoke about uh, Nietzsche as actually nearly someone who realized the supermind on the vital level, who had that glimpse of the supramental influence on the vital level. And uh, his philosophy uh, is actually fully uh, exposed or presented in his work, Thus Spoke Zar Zaratustra. Uh, so this is uh, the only reference that I remember, otherwise, Somebody else may know about this and share with us. And I do, and and please, if anybody has questions, type in the Q and A box. I don't want to take all the time, but I'm so fascinated with this. I do have a question for you, Robin. Um, if you wouldn't uh, mind sharing, um, you mentioned uh, that you had studied astrology, and then you mentioned the use of astrology uh, here with Zoroaster. Austerism. Um, mm. So I'm curious, is that what initially attracted you uh, to this particular uh, uh, spiritual path? Or how is it that you uh, found yourself interested in studying Zoroaster and its aim? No, actually, I not at all. I, um, I really, 
I, it, just a long time ago, I was uh, asked to give a little talk on Zoroaster, and uh, this is many, many years ago, and it was very brief. And um, somehow I ended up with talking about Zoroaster, and I don't recall how, but uh, no, my interest in astrology was completely separate from that, and that happened a long time ago. Um, but uh, the more I read about it, when you when you delve into it, and I've I've got a few books that I used as resources for this, and it's uh, I find it unbelievably fascinating. And what's incredibly interesting to me is that it seems like in this um, Indo-European, this unity of Indo-Europe that we really don't know a whole lot about. Um, there seems to have been a huge amount of uh, interaction between cultures and countries and peoples far more vast than we really recognize today or that archaeologists have found. And one of the things I think that in the future we'll perhaps discover um, more of is that in in Turkey there's this um, find archaeological find called uh, Gobekli Tepe, which dates back I think 11,000 years ago. So about 9,000 BC, and that was a very sophisticated uh, civilization. And on some of the rocks that they've uncovered, there are constellations and astrological signs. And so the knowledge of astrology goes back uh, a long, long way. And we we really don't know what was going on in, in this Central Asia, uh, say, 8,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Um, but there were civilizations there. They were sophisticated. Um, so hopefully, I think it'd be wonderful if we could somehow find out or draw from the Akashic records, you know, a record of what really took place. So it's interesting in you know, the Zoroastrism is this concept of uh, Sashayans, yes, saviors. Yeah. And the saviors, um, there are many. And they are human heroes, and they are those, you know, prophets, and um, they are kind of a human guide. They, it's not one. Mm -hmm. And so I think that influenced Iranian Islam, which differs from uh, Semitic Islam, yes, yeah, so of Arabian countries, where the prophets can be many, not only Muhammad. And that's the biggest difference in Islam, yes between Sunnis and Shiites, yes. Mm -hmm. So that is the Zoroastrian input uh, into Islam also, which is very visible. Mm -hmm. If somebody has some other thoughts or questions from, the, uh, from our audience, so please don't hesitate. You can also maybe raise the hand if you want to say something or better put your question into the question and answer box or Otherwise, uh, to the um, to the chat, if you are not capable of doing this, um, I would like to say also a few words about the whole beginnings, yes, of this mm -hmm. pre-Chaldean, pre-Vedic tradition. Both of these religions, if you listen to Zendavesta, if you listen to the Gathas recorded, they are also recorded, they are uh, chanted the same manner as the Rig Veda. You will not be able to distinguish them between Rig Veda chanting and the Gathas, the oldest part. Uh, we tried this in uh, our Institute of uh, um, Asian Studies in St. Petersburg. Somebody brought Gathas chanted and we put them for Indologists and they said it's Rig Veda <laughs> and it was Gathas. It was amazing. It is so close in the very manner, in the very sound, the same names. This is the Indo-European culture, Indo-European religion, which is very different from Semitic type, which separated before that, before Zoroaster. So uh, this one, and there, there is a worship of fire. We have it in the Veda, the fire, Agni, is the flame of our aspiration, which has, which is the center of our transformation. 
and uh, there is the fire the same in um, in the avesta it is the major of source of all aspiration and a source of all transformation and transformation is taking place in both avesta and rigveda um, these are the fundamentals which they share and of course you know about parsis they live in india they all found refuge in india because uh, they, when Islam spread, they destroyed everything, all other religions. And uh, so few of the Parsis I know personally, they're quite interesting people, they're very brilliant and very courageous. They have still that, you know, Persian courage <laughs> from the past. We have a few questions in the question and answer box. Let's look into them. How would Zoroastrianism define, describe, describe the Barzakh? Do you know anything about this? Barzakh. Barzakh. No, I'm not familiar with that. Barzakh. Can you specify, please, just write another question. No one is asking. What is the source of inspiration, Zoroastrian? You know? Mm -hmm. What is Barzakh? If you specify, we would try. We'll do. Okay. So next question. What do we know about the source of inspiration for the wisdom Zoroaster brought forth? Mm -hmm. What is the source of your wisdom? He, Zoroaster, when he was young, he meditated for those 30 years on a mountain called Ushidarena. And uh, that's where he he spent all of his time in as a recluse, as an ascetic, and uh, he basically came up with the whole, his, that was the source of his inspiration. It was Ahura, what he called Ahura Mazda, and um, he conceived most of his, um, his, his or didn't conceive, but his inspiration came from the time that he spent in meditation when he was actually very young. Um, he had, a, he was also brought up in a, um, he had the inclination to, uh, be very spiritual at a very early age. Uh, so that was something that he did, I think from quite an early uh, point in his life. And, uh, so he must've been in his, uh, mid to late thirties when he went to the King's court to proclaim his whole, um, uh, mission. It is very similar to Moses. He was also doing this on the Sinai. He was meditating until he got his inspiration and created language. Uh, there is, um, I think it's a mythological uh, way of speaking. Yeah? So the same myths found in Krishna was born in the same way Christ. Um, does Zenta Vesta have any human evolution similar to what Sri Aurobindo says, Prigans? Um, the only thing I think the similarities that I know, and there could be a lot more than this, is that um, he, Zoroaster says that we are in a state of evolution um, and that we actually work as co-creators with the divine. So Ahura Mazda is actually employing us as to work with him in bringing about this perfection in the world. And so, and the other thing that's very similar is that Zarasa says that if we establish this state in us correctly and perfectly, that we'll, not, we'll be both happy and we'll achieve physical immortality. So the, the physical immortality actually happens in the flesh as as well it's not something where we die and we go to heaven you know and everything is is fine it, it's actually a material transformation that takes place so I, and i'm sure there's you know there's perhaps a lot more the 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 major part of the zenda vesta was written actually several centuries after the passing of zoroaster it was written during the parthian um, empire 
which is what took place after the collapse of the Greeks in, in Persia. So it was written down because the priests had memorized the various, um, um, or actually, no, it wasn't, it was writings by the priests of what they recalled that Zoroaster had said when he was alive. Kind of like the Bible, the, the New Testament was written in after Jesus had passed away. Yeah, there are many uh, kind of uh, features from your presentation. We can see how they influenced, for example, Christianity, the ideas of in Christianity and Kabbalah and um, and the whole Judaism, yes, uh, archangels, angels, guardian angels, all this comes from uh, from Zoroaster, and these were adopted by you know uh, by uh, Christianity by Augustine, and so he was uh, together with Greeks. He was very familiar, I think, with uh, about these uh, issues. They are all described in his. Uh, the city of God, uh, biggest for his uh, magnum opus. So basically the adaptation of this vision, which came truly speaking from the previous stage of the Rig Veda, yes, and there it was taken and shaped and formed in the new language, which influenced the Western thinking and major uh, Christianity and this that savior comes uh, and helps. It's also a very interesting Christian idea. Yes, there are many Christian ideas here. Yes, uh, and uh, and also this resurrection, <laughs> even resurrection, yeah? um, we, taken by Christianity. Yeah, almost word for word. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing. Another so that, interest. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, another interesting thing is that um, in in the Mediterranean area, there's a, a city called Miletus, which is on the coast of the west coast of Turkey today. That that was the Greek civilization at the time. Um, until Zoroastrian religion got to that town. There was no real, there was, there were cities around Greece, but there was no real philosophy that had developed. It wasn't until the Persians arrived at Miletus that then Greek thought began to take form. And that's why the Greeks attribute a lot of their, the basis for their philosophical thinking to Zoroaster. That kind of gives them credibility. So that's what they, they would use Zoroaster to give themselves validity in what they were thinking. And that's how Zoroastrianism proceeded to the West. And if it hadn't been for the Greeks defeating the Persians, the, the terminology of Zoroastrianism probably would have spread throughout the rest of the Mediterranean. Uh, even uh, with defeat, it spread because uh, it's still, this, is, uh, this sure. works in the mind. So through, and what is interesting that Zoroaster was a, in a way, the messenger to the West of all the Indian Vedic ideas um, shaped in his own way and presented to the West. So this is how India reached out, according to Sri Aurobindo, to the Western civilization. Um, here there are more, few more questions. What happened that Zoroastrianism disappeared? How is that, was that possible? The, I guess the best answer for that is that um, the, the, some of the greatest libraries in the world were destroyed by Alexander and the, army, the Greek armies. Uh, there were huge libraries in Iran. And um, so those, uh, that was the first destruction. The second destruction happened when the Arabs came into Persia. And they again, they had recreated all of the writings again, and they had reestablished libraries. And then the Arabs came in and they burned lot of those as well. So these conquerors, I mean, you know, we call Alexander the Great. Uh, yeah, he was a great, great at destroying other people's armies. That's what he was good at. <laughs> 
but in terms of actually being great in a in a true sense maybe someday in the future that will be reconsidered as Shubhinu sometimes says, the conqueror is conquered. Because when you come to a new culture such as Persian and conquer it, then all the ideas, all the vision comes through you, sinks in <laughs> and comes to Greece and changes the whole world. So uh, this is the way how cultures interact. So there is another question. If the final judgment, it states, that all souls will be eventually saved and become immortal, then why would some souls fall into hellish pain from the narrow bridge and to what end? Gita Sri is asking. <laughs> well, that was because the by going into the hellish realms, a soul gets purified. And um, that uh, the idea that pain purifies is not exclusive to this, um, but uh, that's that's how uh, I guess it's a very quick transformation that happens so that the person is prepared to go into the celestial world. Mm. Yeah, it's a very good answer, I believe. Yes, so the pain is a chisel by which we sculpture the God in us. Yes. Mm. So through that pain and uh, we see the, the shortcomings of our consciousness. So mundus imaginatis, imaginalis, sorry, best defined by Henry Corbin, Suf Sufic scholar on uh, Suhrawad Avardi. I do not know this literature, so sorry. In simple terms, it is the realm of the symbolic. Egyptians would have called it the realm of the nether, netters, uh, where there is a correspondence with the higher human consciousness. Socrates may have uh, referenced this as the realm of the diamonic, going back to at least Pythagoras, if not Homer, and their initiation into Egyptian wisdom schools, Herodotus. So I do not know what you can gather from this. It's, um, it's an explanation, I guess. We need to know more about this. So we are not so familiar with the reference. I, at least, I'm not familiar. But I hope um, it is a good hint where we have to look into it. There is no question here, so I just read the... Well, this, this was in response to her earlier uh, question when we asked her to define Barzak. Oh, uh, Barzak. That... Yeah. yeah. We could bring her over if she's open to uh, yes, joining Maureen, us. Yes, would you like her? Let me just see if I can... <clears throat> there she is. We're just going to invite you over, Marie, to promote you as panelist so that maybe you can share a little bit about your wisdom and what you know about this. Well, let's see if she uh, may, may not come over, but I've invited, there she comes. Mm -hmm. And then you can just, uh, yep, yeah, and if you want to show your video, that's fine. Up to you. Can you hear us, Marie? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Just a little louder if you could. Okay, let me see if I can up the volume here. Or just speak a little louder. Can you hear me now? Yes. Well, okay. yeah. I'm sorry, I'm trying to be mute, a, a bit muted because there's so much noise behind me. We're having music lessons in the background. Uh, okay, mm. no problem. And they're little children, so you know it's not melodious. Um, anyway, uh, not yet anyway. So, um, yeah, I just brought up the Barzakh because it is a foundational concept in Sufism. And it is also a foundational concept in Gnosticism. And uh, the Egyptians wouldn't have called it the Barzakh, but it would have been the foundation of their um, 
hieroglyphic um, symbols of the netters. So it has a, it was truly a realm of correspondence. The, you know, we call it the imaginal realm, but it really has nothing to do with imagination as we conceive of it, you know, where we're just, you know, having fantasies. Uh, it is an actual realm where it, it's, it's hard to define. You have to do a lot of sort of familiarizing yourself to get a feel for it. But it's as if it's the realm where uh, you the the gods, if you will, the forces and e e uh, Egyptian religion was also monotheistic. But like the Vedas, it'd be interesting to see what the relationship is. But like the Vedas, the uh, monotheism was assumed, and so the forces were defined and engaged with as netters. Uh, but the netters. Uh, would materialize themselves as these symbolic forms so that human higher level of consciousness could have a relationship with something that on in the mundus imaginalis was familiar to the higher human level of consciousness so it it was so there were the net the netter representation was the engaging in that realm of um, familiarity. It was neither the highest realm, nor was it the realm that we live in as human beings, even on an intellectual level. The intellect, as with Socrates and Plato, was simply a vehicle to get to that higher step or that mundus imaginalis. And I'm, I'm not doing this a great deal of service but this gives you a sort of general idea as you took this sort of epistemological journey. This was one of the steps. So Henry Corbin, who was a very famous uh, Sufi scholar of Surawardi, Surawardi dealt a lot with this realm of light, this mundus imaginalis uh, in a lot of his writings as well. So it's a foundational point uh, it appears in many of the great uh, mystic traditions uh, and religious traditions, but on the more mystical end of these religions, it also exists within uh, esoteric Christianity. So is it something? Just... Is it something? May I ask? Uh, something like uh, the subtle worlds in which yes. we. Yes. Uh, fall when we go to sleep or we go into this, uh, you know, vital world, subtle worlds, and yeah, we have it, some, yes? They, they call sleep the best, um, sleep is not actually entering that yet, but sleep is the best analogy for what the subtle worlds would be like, yes. All right, all right. That's why imagination is used that you could... I, I was thinking what it could be. So, so it's a vital world closer to the physical, where we are in the physical body, in our system of thinking, yes, most probably. It'd be very interesting to see how this uh, moves, because there are links here in the passageway of this knowledge, uh, which would have been engaged with globally without actually having to have a physical presence. In other words, an Egyptian priest would not have to go to India. You know, I think the highways were- All right, you, you mean exteriorization that. even, yes? yes? Yeah, they, they would not be necessary to-, to, to oh. I, don't, I don't think there was a lot of exteriorization at a certain level in these schools. You know, I think it was one, in, in a sense, one uh, with its local der derivatives because every culture is different. But um, I don't see a lot of, I don't hear the Vedic tradition, which I don't know well at all, uh, speaking about this particular realm. But I am quite certain it is defined in its own way there. And it was a realm that um, was constantly entered in and out of, because that would, that's considered to be the, everything that we see in this realm is simply a derivative. It would be like the platonic realm of um, uh, pure forms, right? Right, yeah. It's a subtle physical and beyond. Subtle physical, what we call in our system, and then vital worlds, 
which is closer to the physical than vital in itself, than uh, higher vital, which is closer to the mental realms. We have the whole hierarchy in the Vedic vision also, uh, realms upon realms, yes, in the subtle world. And I think one of those would be that Barzakh. Yeah. Well, they, they, all these traditions enlighten one another. Yeah, definitely. And since everything, according to Sri Aurobindo and according to our understanding, because the Veda yeah. is dated much earlier yeah. than any of these religions, yes. If yes. Taittiriya Samhita is dated from the, um, from the uh, material in Taittiriya 6000 BC, then what to say about Rig Veda? It's much earlier than Taittiriya. So most probably all those ideas and the realms and experience were already defined in their own language. And by the way, I must say that the whole Zoroastrianism is using also the, the Indo-European terminology and Ahura Mazda is actually Asura. Asura means the, the Lord, the one who has power of being, Asu, from root As to be not asura as the uh, asura, not light, but opposite, asu is the being, power, powerful being, and mazda is medha, medha is the wisdom, or that quintessential beingness. And so if you combine them, you will have asura medha or ahura mazda. They are very closely related languages. And uh, many ideas are actually uh, available in Zoroastrianism in, uh, from uh, the Veda, I believe so. Um, thank you, uh, Maureen, for your uh, kind of bringing this forward, this subtle worlds where we are traveling and everything in the physical is manifested from that world. That's very valuable. Thank you. There is one more question, I guess, and uh, we can stop at that. Um, it's important to understand the factors which led to growth of Abrahamic religions over earlier sophisticated religious thoughts and finally to Islam. Please advise regards. Well, do you have something to advise, Robin? One thing is that, um... In the uh, in Judaism, uh, the Jews had been um, enslaved by the Babylonians for many many centuries, and um, <clears throat> when the when the, there was Persian influence into Babylon, and so that's how there was a, a mixing of the cultures, the the original culture. So that's how the the original source of the Abrahamic religions would have been introduced to the to the Hebrews at you know if they didn't have it prior to that it could have been and who knows how much but it it appears that there were a lot of Zoroastrianism which had become part of the Babylonian culture was introduced into the Hebrew uh, culture and then of course from there it spread to both to Christianity, the Old Testament, and then later to Islam. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I also think that uh, this uh, split which happened between Semitic traditions and the Indo-European traditions, yes, uh, such as Persian or the Zoroastrian and Vedic, Indo-Aryan and Semitic, there is a border between them. They, are, they have different sources of language, as it were. Uh, the language of the Jews was created by, by Moses. He was also meditating on Sinai and he brought to his people of Israel the language, which was codifying the whole Bible and codifying because you can read Bible in two different ways, in Kabbalistic way, uh, so to say esoteric way and exoteric as the story. So, um, that tradition, Jew, Jewish tradition, actually inherited um, or took from the common source of pre-Caldean pre-Vedic tradition um, a movement of uh, or the focus on power 
and embodiment and effectuating force of manifestation rather than knowledge. So the knowledge deviated and became the major focus for the Indian civilization, whereas power and focus on alchemy and change and magic, mm. magic, magician, you know, it came to, to the um, Middle East and finally to uh, people of uh, Israel. So they took this knowledge and it generated and built on it Kabbalah, Kabbalistic approach to knowledge. It's a very sacred and very powerful knowledge, which explains how the world is made. It's also on the same base of the Vedic knowledge, but the focus is on manifestation and power. So knowledge and power got separated. Knowledge stayed with India and uh, exalted in the uh, the Advaitic approach, where the nature was neglected for the sake of the spirit to be realized. And in the West, it, um, it turned to be a totally opposite, materialistic scientific paradigm, which wants to manage uh, manifestation. So this split took place, as Shirobindo says, because of the Vedic rishis who could not transform the earthly life because the human beings were not ready. That transformation, that sacrifice we mentioned at the beginning was not uh, so uh, effective. And so there was a choice made to go one hand went for knowledge, for the spirit, to keep up with the spirit neglecting nature and the other uh, half went for the power forgetting the spirit slowly and uh, moving away from the spiritual realization. So this is the East and West. And now Sri and the mother come with their integral yoga to integrate these two parts, absolutely important to be integrated. And we can see that in Zoroastrianism, we still have that oneness of power and uh, knowledge. And in the Veda also, they are the last remnants of this oneness of knowledge and power. So this is um, this was a good uh, treat. Thank you, Robin, so much for your wonderful and detailed presentation. We learned a lot today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. It was really very, very interesting learning and reading about uh, Zoroastrianism. It's really, it's amazing that such a sophisticated religion could have existed so long ago. And it's so sad that it didn't continue. But it did, you know, it was the, the religion and the civilization in Central Asia, all the way from Greece to India, for probably over, I didn't total it up, but probably for over a thousand years, which when you consider how long this country has been in existence, you know, we're nothing so far. Mm -hmm. And it was such a harmonious civilization, that's why it lasted so long. Mm -hmm. Everybody was happy to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much and namaste. Namaste. Mm -hmm. Namaste.